Hello, and welcome to today's program at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Audrey Cooper, the Editor-in-Chief of the San Francisco Chronicle, and I'm honored to be your moderator tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce our special guest. Mark Benioff is an inter internet entrepreneur, author, and philanthropist. He is also the chairman and co-CEO of Salesforce, which he founded in 1999. Salesforce has more than 150,000 customers worldwide, including the vast majority of Fortune 500 companies, and it is San Francisco's largest private employer. Mr. Benioff's family goes back many generations in San Francisco. Roots, he says, helped him to, to develop his philosophy that business leaders must be advocates for social progress. Salesforce is known for its 111 model of philanthropy, which uses company resources to improve communities around the world. Mr. Benioff says these values have propelled Salesforce's tremendous financial success, as well as securing it a regular place on the list of the most uh, best companies to work for. In his new book, Trailblazer, The Power of Business as the Greatest Platform for Change, Mr. Benioff revisits his values of philanthropy, strongly advocating that businesses can and should make the world a better place. We're excited to have him with us here tonight. Everyone, please welcome Mark Benioff. Thank you. Thank you. So, welcome home. You've Thank been on this crazy book tour around the world and in New York. Every time I turned on the television, you were decrying the end of capitalism. So how did that go in New York? It was a busy week last week, actually. It was busy. How's everybody doing tonight? We're good. No, it's, it's good to be home. It's been a busy week. I, um, I was in Tacoma, Washington on Sunday. On Monday, I was in... Uh, London. On Tuesday, I was in Munich. On Wednesday, I was in, in uh, New York City. Thursday, Washington, D.C., and then Friday, back home. So it was kind of a whirlwind, so you but get I'm to happy to be here. Be at home tonight. Yes, I am. So very happy. Every time um, I have talked to you, at some point you say, when are you going to ask me about what Salesforce actually does? <laughs> so why don't you give us your elevator pitch to explain to a layperson what is Salesforce? Go. Very good. All right. Well, uh, how many of you have bought Adidas tennis shoes? Anybody raise your hand? Well, if you've bought Adidas tennis shoes and you go to the Adidas website, or you've got an email from Adidas, or you talk to their customer service representative, or you go into an Adidas store and you talk to a salesperson, you're actually interacting with Salesforce. And what Salesforce is doing is it's helping companies and their customers connect in incredible new ways. And even right here in the front row, we have Sam Hoggood, who's the chancellor of UCSF, so thank you, Sam, for everything that you do. And for UCSF, for example, uh, Salesforce helps them run uh, part of their breast cancer research program, including their iSpy trials. So if you go into UCSF and you fill out a form or you're participating in, in certain types of trials, you might be interacting with Salesforce as well. So any place where companies are, or universities are trying to connect with their customers in new ways, Salesforce is helping in that process. And do you think there's anything unique about what Salesforce does that positions the company? Nothing unique at all. That's <laughs> pretty much it, actually. Nobody else says it better. That's pretty much the but, end of it. But actually, is there right anything? There. Is there? All right, bye. Hard to know um, from there. <laughs> is there, what is it about what the company does that uniquely positions it, do you think, to have this model for social good and philanthropy? Well, 21 years ago, when we started our company, which was at 1499 Montgomery, right up on Telegraph Hill next to my house, where I was living at the time, which was 95 Telegraph Hill Boulevard, um, there were three things that we wanted to do. We wanted to create a new technology model, which we call the cloud. Uh, we wanted to create a new business model, which was the idea that you're subscribing to software instead of buying a license. And the third thing was we wanted to basically create a new philanthropic model. So we put 1% of our equity, 1% of our profit, 1% of all of our time. It was very easy actually because we had no employees, we had no profit, we had no time, we had <laughs> one, nothing. 1% of nothing right. is very low. <laughs> so 
that really turned out to be something because now we have 45,000 employees. We've been able to do 4 million hours of volunteerism. We run 40,000 nonprofits and NGOs for free on our service, including UCSF, who does not pay us for that service. That's a good and price. And we also have been able to give away about $300 million in uh, grants, and we're even a net zero company doing all that. So uh, we have no carbon uh, emissions. So, I mean, we do, but no positive emissions into the planet. So, I mean, one way to look at that is we have a stakeholder return, we call it. Those are our key stakeholders. We also have had a great shareholder return. If you bought our stock when we went public in 2004, you'd have a 3,500% uh, return so far. Yeah, I wish I had done that. <laughs> uh, so can you explain I've heard to that us, a lot, actually. Yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> can you explain this 111 model? How did you come up with that? And when was the first time you articulated it to your mm -hmm. business partners? Well, it really kind of all happened around 1996. What happened was I was working at Oracle from 86 to 96. And in 1996, here I was actually on Telegraph Hill and not feeling very good. I actually was having a hard time just getting up in the morning, was not motivated, was not excited, not energized at all, and kind of just upset, maybe a little bit depressed. And I went in and talked to my boss at the time, Larry Ellison, and I said, well, this is how I'm feeling and I don't really know if I can continue with my job. And he said, well, I think you should go take a sabbatical. And I said, well, what's a sabbatical? What does that mean? He said, well, that means where you're going to take some extended time off more than a vacation, take off three months. So I said, well, that sounds like a great idea. So I kind of folded up my shop, and I went off to Hawaii for a few months and did, did a few things. You know, I did some hiking, some swimming in the ocean, some dolphins went by. And, <laughs> and then, all of a sudden... One, one, one came to your head. Well, I no. came back, and I said to him, I'm still not actually feeling that great. And he said, no problem, take a little bit more time off. And I went to India. And so I went on to India and I had a really interesting trip. And I went with a friend of mine, Arjun Gupta, and he had just quit his job. He had been working for George Soros and he quit his job. He was gonna start a new company right here called Telesoft Partners and we were going through India. And he was born in New Delhi, but he had never really seen India. So we were having a fabulous time and going to all these different places, Bangalore and Bombay and Puttaparte and visiting these different gurus and spiritual people. It was very exciting. And then we got to a place in the Kerala region of India, which is the southern part of, of India, in a, in a city called Trivandrum on the backwaters of the Arabian Sea. And we were in an ashram, which is kind of like a guru's corporate headquarters, okay? <laughs> and we're back there with kind of the head of the ashram. In, 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 in the south of India, the gurus are women, and this is a, a, a woman named Amichi, and she's known as the Hugging Saint, and we're, it's, there's incense wafting by. It's like a movie, okay? Music is happening, and she's giving us a lecture, and all of a sudden, she says, well, do you have any questions? And so Arjun said, well, let me tell you about my uh, company. I'm gonna start Telesoft Partners. And he took his business plan out of his backpack and he started pitching her. And I went, wow, this is really interesting. <laughs> and about a half an hour later, I'm like, wow, I can't believe he's really going still. And I actually think she might be investing. <laughs> and then she basically goes getting ready to say something to him. But when she said it to him, she looked right in my eyes and she said, Arjun, in your quest to change the world, don't forget to do something for others. And what happened for me was I kind of felt that two parts of myself, one part, which was my work self and where I was working every day and all of that and making money and building great products and doing technology. And then my other side over here, which was more my philanthropic self and my giving back self and my part that was you know, about generosity, well, those two things, all of a sudden, they combined. They came together. And when they did come together, then I, right then in that moment, I go, you know, if I ever start a company, then I want to make sure that it's a company that not only does well, but does good. 
And I had this vision that we could take this one, 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 one model and this idea, one, 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 that it could be a way to give back. And so it was a funny thing. I came back from the trip and I started working again and I started to feel really good because I was, felt like that part of myself was really quite healed. And I got a call to go to Philadelphia to um, hear this uh, summit called the President Summit for America's Future. And Colin Powell and the five living presidents were gonna be there and it was the 200 C top CEOs of the country and somehow I was in the audience. And Colin Powell came out and he said, well, let me tell you something. The reason why we brought all of you here is because all of you corporate chiefdoms and heads of companies in the country, we need you, you know? Because in your quest to take over the world, we want you to do something for somebody else. And I went, whoa, I just heard the same thing twice. It was kind of shocking to me. It was maybe only about a three or four month gap. And I'm like, I think this is like actually something that's a theme that's gonna repeat in my life. So when we started the company, we took it quite seriously. And you know, here we are today, and we've had a fabulous uh, shareholder return and stakeholder return. So w it, you say in the book that you think U.S. business, tech in specifically, but t U.S. business in general has lost its way. And I think in San Francisco, we tend to blame tech for everything that has changed because they've been uh, sort of on parallel paths in a lot of way. But, but do you think it goes back before the first dot-com boom, before the internet? I mean, where did American go business go wrong in your opinion? Well, I mean, I think that there's two different ways to look at it. One is, I guess very deeply, you know, I think we do need a new capitalism. I think kind of the old capitalism as we know it is dead. And we need a new capitalism, which is a more fair, a more equal, a more sustainable capitalism, a capitalism that balances shareholders and stakeholders together. Th this is really the idea of the new capitalism, you know, that companies can do well and do good that companies are these tremendous resources with relationships and technologies and products and all employees, all this capability, they can be unleashed you know, for the public good, not just for you know, making money, but doing so much more. And that can be the basis of a new capitalism. And I think the second part is that when I went to business school, which was in Los Angeles at USC way back in 1982 to 1986, you know, I didn't take any classes on equality or, you know, uh, philanthropy or, or uh, stakeholderism or any of the things that, you know, are interesting to me now in business. Those are all things that kind of have unfolded since. And that really, I think, is the basis for a new business, that we still have a lot of CEOs like me who are kind of trained in the old ways. And I think a new way of business is really starting to be un unleashed. And you've been really vocal about this in San Francisco, uh, worldwide, really. I was surprised in the book. I even wrote a book about it. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so outspoken. I was surprised in the book that you started with your time at Oracle because I think I had assumed, like, you, in some ways you can't find two more different companies in, in the Bay Area than Oracle and Salesforce. And I, and I think you've been really successful in some ways of both calling out um, tech leaders that you think aren't doing enough, but also being very respectful to not do it by name. And I'm wondering, how do you... There's been a few names. Okay, well. <laughs> but how, how do you compartmentalize this? Because these are your customers, they're your colleagues, you're going to dinner with them, you're, they're, you're trying to convince them, but some of them just flatly say no. Well, you're 100% right, which is, and you know this story very well, which is only about a year ago, we were really working on Proposition C right here in San Francisco. And that was that, you know, it's as clear as day. I mean, I'm walking right now to our beautiful new Salesforce Tower, and we have this terrible homeless problem right here in our city, where homelessness just this year increased 17%. And we're just not doing enough. We need a lot more extremely low-income housing. We need a lot more social services. We just need to do a lot more. And that's gonna take a lot more money. And so, what was really interesting to me was that some of the top homeless advocates in the city had gotten together, people that we had funded and worked with and said, hey, 
What about this idea? A proposition where the top 50 employers in the city pay a one half percent revenue tax. And if they did that, well, that would generate 30 million a month, $300 million a year, and we have a dramatic difference in the homeless. And I said, that actually sounds like a really good idea. So I, you know, of course, it took a lot of courage. I had to also talk to my lead director, Sandy Robertson, who's in the front row right here. And I had to say, all right, well, are we gonna really go for this? And in fact, we did. We said, okay, we're gonna put $7 million into getting this passed. We got 62% of the vote. And this was something that I still think is, has to happen. It's now in the courts because we only, only got to 62%, not 66%. So the thing that's interesting about that was when we were in that fight, all of a sudden, you know, I thought we had everybody with us and I was getting some positive phone calls. And then all of a sudden, as you know very well, there are people who started to come out against us and say, no, this isn't right. Everything's fine. We're, we're, there must be a better way. We can do it differently. And there's a resistance started to build up. And I was like, wow, I can't believe it. And some of that resistance came from people who are very close to me and CEOs and others. And so it was a little bit of a battle in the city. Does everybody remember this story about a year ago? And, you know, this is kind of the battle of the old capitalism versus the new capitalism. The old capitalism is, hey, everyone, you're on your own. The new capitalism is businesses are here to serve not only their shareholders, but their stakeholders, their employees, their customers, their partners, their, the public schools, the homeless, the planet as a stakeholder, that companies have more responsibility than just making money, and that that can be a part of who they are, their culture, and the new capitalism, and that is what this is really all about. So, so when you would have private conversations with your colleagues and customers about Prop C or anything else that you want them to get involved in, and they, and they blow you off, what is their excuse? Well, I think that, you know, it's kind of like this. You know, when I went to business school, basically the first thing that you're taught as a CEO is if they say tax, you say no. So <laughs> do you want a new tax? No, you know? And you can just take that to the logical extreme where it's like zero taxes, that there's no fundamental responsibility for the social good. And that, I think, is really you know, um, I think still in the, hypno the kind of the hypnosis or the subconscious of many CEOs. So when I give a discussion or a talk like this, but the CEOs in the audience, you know, it's actually, there can be an awakening where people say, yeah, I do have these resources. And, and by the way, like when we're talking about taxing the top 50 employers in San Francisco, the top three are Salesforce, Facebook, and Google. Have you heard of them? You know, they can afford it. So it's like, this is a small, percentage that we're asking to give back. We're not asking for everything. We're just saying, hey, this can actually create a better company because we want companies to be integrated into the communities that they serve. We don't want to be separate from them. We want to be companies to be integrated with the planet itself. We don't want to be separate from the planet. We're an integrated part. You know, it's one integrated humanity. It's one humanity. Business is part of it. But when we think that we're separate, that's when we're gonna get ourselves into trouble, and that's what we're trying to break down. So when you talk about the new capitalism, you, you can't really regulate good ethics. You can't regulate a CEO to behave. So what do you think structurally needs to change besides just CEOs kind of waking up and realizing they have a role to it? Well, I think that you can regulate it. And actually, I think that you know, we are regulated in our business. We're regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission because our company is actually a New York Stock Exchange company. We are, you know, regulated by the Securities and Exchange Committee and other also um, government agencies here and around the world. We're subject to laws. And the SEC could actually put into place a request for companies to report not only on their quarterly returns but on their and their, their shareholder returns but on their stakeholder returns, to list your stakeholders. Who are you in business to serve? And that, so I do think that businesses can actually be regulated to um, have a full stakeholder return. 
One of the other things that, that's very clear about you and Salesforce is that you really highly prioritize the feedback from your employees. Um, and I'm thinking there are examples in the book like when the uh, female executives came to you and, at, and told you that uh, Salesforce was underpaying women, something that eventually cost $10 million to fix. When you got involved with then Indiana Governor Mike Pence to try to uh, stop that state from discriminating against gay people. But then there's also been lately a lot of um, criticism that Salesforce still has a contract with the Customs and Border Protection uh, Agency, something that you said you could not and would not change. As the company gets bigger and as the issues that we're facing get more complex, do you think this is something that you're going to have to grapple with in an increasing amount? Well, I think we are, and I, I mean, I like to take all three of those and I'll add another one on their firearms. So I think that, you know, in the first, the first thing that you asked about in terms of gender equality, you know, our female employees came to us and said, well, you know, you're paying women less than men. How do you feel about that? And the funny thing was is the women who actually came to me, it was a lunch and so forth, I said, I know that's not true because I actually created your salaries. But the reality was that when we looked at the analytics of our business, they were right that women were systemically being paid less than men. I was like, that could not be, so that needs to be healed. We did heal it, and we made that change. Then all of a sudden we realized, wow, that change is happening again, that all of a sudden in our business the same analytics started to, to appear. The reason why, we had bought a number of businesses, and it turns out when you buy a business, you don't just buy their product, their technology, their brand, you also buy their pay scales. And they, so we assumed all of their pay scales, so we had to adjust now several times, and we do this annually, because, look, we believe equal pay for equal work, that men and women should be paid the same for the same work, and that we're going to audit that on a regular basis. <laughs> so that's a story that we tell in the book. Second story that we talk about is, you're right, here I am, San Francisco, the home of gay rights, the summer of love, I'm born on Divisadero Street. I get a phone call from my employees in Indiana. Now, I can tell you that you may not know, but Salesforce is the largest tech company in Indiana. And if you ever go to Indianapolis, not only do we have a gorgeous Salesforce tower here, we have one in Indianapolis too. It's a stunner. And I knew the governor very well, Mike Pence, because you know he's there when we're launching our company, and I knew all the local you know, politicians and so forth. And so my employees call me and say, well, Mark, I have to tell you, you know, they're about to sign a law that's going to discriminate against the LGBTQ employees and against our customers and the whole community. And I said, that's not possible. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know that's not true, right? They go, no, really, it's going to happen. Okay, well, uh, to what should I do? You need to write a letter. You need to do this. Fine. So we wrote the letters and all that. So then I'm driving home from a dinner from San Jose, home on 280, and all of a sudden I see on Twitter that um, it turns out that Mike Pence has signed the law. So I said, well, this cannot be true. He cannot have signed this law. So I tweeted, probably should have called Sandy first, by the way, <laughs> or maybe Bernard is in the front row, I should have called him. And then I tweeted, well, we're going to have to de-invest from Indiana now that Mike Pence has signed that law because we can't invest in a state who's discriminating against LGBTQ. So we're out. And, you know, because how are we going to bring our customers? How are we going to hire? How are we going to do our work there? And all of a sudden, that tweet went viral. And the next day, hundreds of companies said exactly the same thing. So then I'm at home. I'm at home, I'm working out, you know, having a nice time. My phone rings. It's Mike Pence. Hey, Mike. That How's it going? happens to me all the time. <laughs> going great. Why are you calling? Well, I have a little problem here in Indiana. What's the problem? Well, you know, uh, this law. And I said, well, what are you going to do about it? He goes, I don't know. What are you going to do about it? I said, well, Mike we're gonna to have to issue a set of rolling economic sanctions against the state of Indiana. 
He said, well, what does that mean? I said, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> We're going to have to do it. And, you know, I said, look, Mike, why don't we just work this out? You know, this is something that I'm sure that we can resolve. You know, we know each other. Let's just talk it through. Let's figure this out. We put a couple of employees on a plane. We went there. We negotiated with him. A couple days later, it was all behind us. By the way, we need a lot more of that in this country. You know, we can resolve a lot through dialogue and communication, collaboration, and just people talking to each other. So that was just an example of trying to understand what was going on. And that was actually difficult, because I'm trying to listen to them. And the third example is all of a sudden, our employees sent us an, uh, a letter, an email. And they said, well, what are you doing about the Customs and Border Patrol? And they outlined this issue. And you know, it's something that you know, I can't say I completely understand everything that they're talking about. Obviously, the CBP is the largest law enforcement agency in the country. There is many things associated with the CBP. All of us know that anyone who's been, anyone go through customs at the airport recently? OK, well, now you know somebody who works there. <laughs> and we're doing some work with them on their recruiting site, OK? So I'm like, I need a way to be able to deal with this. Because then something else happened, which was our employees came to us and said, hey, did you know that you, we have this customer that's selling assault rifles on our, on our, using our commerce cloud? What are you going to do about it? And actually, there's a lot of what are you going to do about it. There's a list of them. So I'm like, I need to create a process. And what we did was we created a process called the Office of Ethical and Humane Use. We hired a top ethicist in the Bay Area, Paula Goldman from the Skoll Foundation. We built a network of relationships with um, the top NGOs and nonprofits in, in ethics and also in ethical use of product. And then we actually turned all these things over to her. And in some cases, we've had to make changes with who our customers are. In other cases, we've been able to say, no, this customer, you can see, this is ac actually an ethical use of our product. So we're in a new world. Companies cannot wash their hands of what their customers are doing with their products. That's clear as day, OK? But we need a process, because I'm not an expert in all these things. You can't say that I am the judge and jury on all these things. It just doesn't work, you know? And that there's a Supreme Court, which is my board of directors. It's not exactly you know, the best process. Instead, the best process is, Actually, let's build a network and have a multi-stakeholder dialogue, and then we can make decisions based on kind of you know a clearly defined way of doing things. And I think that's the best way that we have to go through going forward. So does that get more complicated as you grow into other cities? I mean, in San Francisco, we have probably a fairly monolithic set of priorities. Nobody's going to pass an anti-gay law in San Francisco, but in other areas, there might be employees who say, I think it's completely ethical to do business with gun manufacturers who sell assault rifles. And I think that's why you have to have, you have to be able to look at, here's the ethics. Here's the ethics, here's the process, here's the non-governmental organizations, people like Amnesty International or the Red Cross or people that we have relationships with who are able to say, here's the actual facts. And then our team can make the decision based on that. The number one thing we cannot have is saying to the CEO is going to make all of those, those calls. One of the things that Salesforce is defending itself now in court is a lawsuit against, uh, where 50 women filed a lawsuit saying they were trafficked for sex work through Backpage.com, and that Salesforce helped Backpage get more customers that contributed to the sex trafficking. The FBI shut the, that site down before you started this, uh, uh, this department. Do you think that those sort of issues would come to the fore? And are you going to be public about them when you make decisions about it? Well, I think that this is really the exact you know, example. This, and by the way, thousands of other examples that I've seen over 21 years of running the company. Because when you have hundreds of thousands of customers, and you have 45,000 employees and partners all over the world, there's no way that you're going to be able to have an understanding of every company and every brand and every issue. But employees, or, and really all stakeholders, need to be able to surface to a clear process or authority to be able to come in and say, OK, 
Now we need to make this change. And for example, that's a great example where in, in that exact process, we recently said we're not going to sell weapons of war on our service. It, it doesn't work for us. And that came through the process. And then it get, basically gets brought up as a decision through the Office of a, an Ethical and Humane Use. Do you think that's getting more difficult as more people get outraged by, for example, gun manufacturers, and they want you to say publicly and shame them all, shame the tech leaders, and shut down that, that conversation? Are you getting a lot of pressure to do that? Well, I think that one of the things that's really interesting about that is that if you actually ask our employees what to do, it splits right down the middle, 50-50, you know? Uh, here's, you know, their position on guns. Here's their position on guns. At some point, we're going to have to be able to find the right way through that. And that's why if you don't have those kind of processes, you're not going to be able to, to do that. I think that that one was really well defined for us and like, was really like, gave us a lot of clarity because we saw that incredible bifurcation. And then we want to be able to make that decision. But I'll tell you that once we made our decision and that it was written about in the Washington Post, et cetera, still, of course, we're going to have employees who are upset that they don't think that's the right thing. But we have to be able to lean on our process. This is what we, at the end of the day, we have to be able to make that statement say, this, this, this is how we made the decision. At the beginning of this conversation, you re referenced some of the religious experiences you had early in your career. Would you, do you consider yourself a religious man? I would say I'm, yeah, I would say I was a spiritual person. And, and how does that, how do you bring that into Salesforce? Because it, it exists in a number of ways. Well, I think it's all about our values, you know? So what is, what is Salesforce about? What are the values that we're going to be able to say are the most important things to us? I mean, I think that's something that all of us have to ask. What is the most important thing to us? For us, it's trust. Nothing is more important than the trust we have with all of our stakeholders, with our employees, our customers, our partners. I think this is one of the reasons that we've been kind of consistently voted one of the best places to work in the world is because trust is our highest value. We're able to vault that up very highly and say, this is really important to us. And we want to have that level of trust and transparency with everything that we're doing. By the way, that's also connected back to your last question, which is some of these processes have to have this level of transparency. The second piece is, um, for us, our core value is customer success. We want to make sure our customers are successful. That is the most important thing to, for us to be successful, but it's not above trust. And then innovation, the ability to continue to innovate and change and to be able to you know, add value in, in, in the technology industry and differentiate ourselves. And the fourth is equality, that we're about the equality of every human being. And those four values are really what Salesforce has really become about. And if I guess that coupled with our one 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 model with giving back, if we had a spirituality, you know, it would be very much it's a currency of trust. You also you, you talk about how you meditate every morning, every morning? Yes. Sometime every day. I did today. Yes. Why and, and you have mindfulness rooms on every floor of Salesforce Tower here. Is, is that something you have in all of the buildings that Salesforce operates in? On every Salesforce floor of every building worldwide, there's a mindfulness room where somebody can come in. And, you know, I mean, the reality, we're just switched on all the time. We're on all the time. We have our phones with us. We're, uh, you know, we're on social media. We're on the news. We're doing all these various things. We're switched on. We need to be able to switch off. And that's one of the great things about mindfulness is the ability to take a breath, to relax, to stop, and to say, oh, I'm here. I'm here now. Like, that is kind of very much a core of who we are. And that idea that we have the ability to become more mindful, that transcends many religious disciplines. We can offer that as a uh, asset for all of our employees to participate that in uh, at work. And many of them have taken a, take advantage of that. You're, you're uh, I think I talk about that actually in the book, even where different religions both show, show up in a mindfulness room together. 
And I think in one, one story in the book, you know, there are um, uh, two different religions in, that are participating in their practices. They're both in there. And then all of a sudden, they kind of turn to each other and start to talk to each other and become friends. And it's like we have a lot of good examples of that. So I think that that is uh, something that a lot of businesses can, can, can offer their uh, offer their employees. Well, and you, it, you mentioned you had these experiences in Tokyo, you had these experiences in India, you, you love Hawaii, and it's, it's very sincere, and it seems to be something that you really want other employees to experience too. So, but I'm curious, w when you have a, a group, a, a company chat box, it's called Chatter? Something mm -hmm. like that, and some, and you got some recent bad publicity because some of the Pacific Islander members of Salesforce were curious or wanted to put forth the argument that some of the Hawaiian um, influences that you have was misappropriate appropriation of their culture. Did that? How did you take that personally, and and what do you do to receive that kind of employee fe feedback when it's something that you are so sincere about personally? Well, I think this is why mindfulness is so great. You know, I think it helps you cultivate a beginner's mind. I think it gives you the ability to maybe not have that initial emotional reaction, or if you do, to sequester it, so that you can take a step back and say, what is this person actually saying? What should, what, how can I help them? What am I, what is the story here? What is the message? and to be able to listen and to be able to receive that. I think that for me, that's what mindfulness has ultimately become. And I think that in a lot of cases, if we are very attached to something, like obviously I have an attachment to why, so then somebody comes in and says, well, you know, this has to change. And then I'm like, whoa, don't take my Hawaii away from me, <laughs> you know? But instead, I need to go, okay, let me just let go here. And let me try to understand what this person is saying. And let me listen. And maybe there's things in there that we should change. And in fact, there were. And we made a decision. By the way, we use the same multi-stakeholder process. So we employ all stakeholders. We involved experts. We talk to people. We ask. We don't, you know, I don't want it all to, I have to be honest with you why that is. I don't really want to carry all this stuff. OK? I don't. I'm willing to facilitate the process. I'm willing to facilitate the energy. But I don't want to have to carry these burdens with me every single day and every single moment. Instead, I can let the process and the energy and all that take over. You know, in these cases, like in many of the cases that you just articulated, instead of me having to be getting involved, you know, I guess, you know, at your case, I'm not, I don't really want to be the editor in chief. You know, I don't want to decide what's on the newspaper cover or magazine cover. I want the process to do that. And that is, you know, has kind of helped me, I think, to continue to be able to innovate and create and have a vision even after over two decades of this work. Because otherwise, I think it can become very toxic that you can take on all these things. And if you're going to take on everybody's burden, then you're never really going to be free, that ultimately your freedom comes when you're able to let all this go and realize, I'm just here to serve whoever I can serve and do the best I can do and, then, and move forward. And that's, that's where I am with this at this point as being a leader in the company. Uh, well, speaking of toxic, you love Twitter. Um, <laughs> And, and I find that so interesting because so much of what you're about is like the, the discourse and, and getting to some sort of consensus and progress. And Twitter seems to be such a nasty place to hang out, especially as a public figure. But you not only like it and use it, you wanted to buy it. What, what, what do you love about Twitter so much? Well, I like it a lot more than Sandy did. So. <laughs> We obviously did not buy it. And I mean, I will lean on this again, and you'll read about everybody here is getting a copy of the book, so you're going to read this story. But you know, I was very, I would say, attached, actually, to buying it. I had a huge vision, you know, which is what happens to me. It's kind of an unfortunate thing that what will happen is all of a sudden, you know, I'll get this vision of 
oh, we can do all these amazing things with Twitter, and I'll build a little presentation of what it could be in a video, in a demonstration, and so forth. And then I'm like, what if we did this? And then getting everybody excited about it, and then everybody got really excited about it except for our shareholders, okay? But our shareholders are a key stakeholder. You know, they are a stakeholder right there with me. And they came and they said, we don't like this idea. And they outlined their vision for why it is. And it's very much kind of what we're talking about actually is kind of connected to this. I have to kind of be able to let go of something that I'm quite attached to. Yes, I really want to do this. This is really important to me. I do have a big vision around this, but I have to let go, you know? And um, I, I have to be able to listen, to receive, to understand. And if I'm really gonna believe in a multi-stakeholder dialogue and I bring everybody in, then I also have to be able to say, okay, I'm gonna let go of that. And I think that this is something that is probably a learned skill. I mean, I'm 55 now, I'm not 35 like when I started the company, I was 34. You know, I don't think I had it as much. I think you definitely learn that. But like this morning, you know, when I'm meditating, it's actually a good example. I've been on the road for a while. I had some meditation time this weekend. But this morning, I'm meditating, and then all of a sudden, I could feel, wow, I actually just was able to let go. And that lets me start the day fresh and new, shiny and new, like a little penny. You know, and go, okay, now I'm going to kind of go it. But that penny is going to get tarnished. There's going to be problems. <laughs> could get some fingernail stuff on there, and then I need to rebirth it a little bit. And that's what that daily meditation process is so important to me. In the same way, I think that the company needs that. And that's what these things can do, like the Office of Ethical and Humane Use, which is run by Tony Prophet, who's here tonight. He's also our chief ethical and humane. He, he has the chief ethical and humane use officer working for him. He's also our chief equality officer. His job is to hold us at these very high standards. And th this idea to be able to kind of hold ourselves at that level means that we're going to attract this kind of attention and also criticism. People are going to put us at the tip of the spear. I cannot personally be at the tip of the spear. It will not be good for me. Mm -hmm. I have got to be able to constantly keep myself clean. That's why the med meditation is so important. It's all actually connected to what you're talking about. Can we talk about my favorite topic, San Francisco? Yes. Um, you have given a lot of money to the city. And one thing that I think we don't talk a lot about, a lot of it has been about Prop C recently, but you also started with a $100 million donation to UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, which, <laughs> which if, I think if any parent has had to go to that ER, we would all agree we would do commercials for you. Uh, it's a wonderful place. You also started caring about homelessness, I believe, around children and family homelessness. What is it about children's issues in the city that initially drew you to them? Well, I would say it's my wife who's sitting right here, Lynn. You know, she is really constantly putting this front and center on the stage for us that this is important to us. Yay, Lynn. <laughs> it, this is, you know, a great example is actually with your newspaper, which is Jill Tucker, who's one of your fabulous reporters, wrote a fabulous story in 2011, I think it was, mm -hmm. about a homeless child here named Rudy in San Francisco, who was homeless in San Francisco public schools. And Lynn and I are actually sitting at the breakfast table, which we don't normally get to do very often, but we are sitting there. And Lynn says, this is a terrible situation. Did you know that one in, how many, what is it? One in 27 one kids in. in San Francisco in the public schools is homeless. And I just was thinking to myself, how can I go to the public school and I'm homeless? How am I gonna learn? How am I gonna function? How am I gonna, and, you know, Lynn had this fabulous idea, which is what about shelters for mother-led families in the city? She brought together a coalition of a number of NGOs, including Hamilton Families, um, Raphael House, Larkin Street, Catholic Charities, others, and hundreds of families have been able to be moved into permanent housing, 
and off the streets uh, with this program, which is now called Heading Home. It actually turned into a program where we've raised over $37 million and uh, has, is a model, I think, for how to actually deal with homelessness in the city. That people, by the way, say this to me all the time. Well, you know, this is an intractable problem. There's no solutions. It's completely not true, which is that here's one example heading home where you see hundreds of families getting moved out of homelessness. And there's many other great examples as well. People are not as educated on the great examples. Actually, you have two other great reporters, Heather Knight and also Kevin Fagan, who have illuminated not only the problem, but many of the solutions. There's a lot more that we can all do. Actually, if we all focused on resolving homelessness in San Francisco, we would resolve homelessness in San Francisco. But we have had to fight it. And, you know, by the way, we should just say, well, there's a reason that Audrey keeps smiling at me, which is that the Chronicle did not support Prop C. The editorial board, even though they had reporters which is who separate are writing from the newsroom, <laughs> let's just say. <laughs> the editorial board voted, basically recommended voting against it. So we had a breakfast to talk about it with John Diaz, who runs the editorial board. But I am not a good salesperson, and I did not make my case, I guess, effectively enough. And they maintain their position. But, you know, that's an example where not everybody agrees with more taxes to solve social issues. So, you know, I think that um, it's very important to me as a, you know, one of my distant cousins is here, told me I'm a fifth generation San Francisco, and I've been telling everyone that well. I've been a fourth generation, but he just laid out the whole family tree from my first relative who was here all the way down to Louis Levin to where I am here. Now, the five generations, I'm a fifth generation San Franciscan, and he also gave me a photo of my grandmother. I was gonna to ask you, it. I was gonna ask you about your grandmother, is this Helen? Right here, who's my grandmother. Helen? Frederica Levin oh, Frederic. Lewis, yeah. And you ran a great story about my grandfather, who she was married to, Marvin Lewis, on Sunday. Thank you for doing that. And well, he cared a lot about homelessness as an issue, too, as a city supervisor. Well, and then the person who's putting on the program here tonight handed me this, and he wrote a story about my grandfather, George Dobbins, who introduced this tonight. And here's my grandfather sitting in a lawn chair at his home, topless, so I don't know. <laughs> Lynn, if this should be my next photo <laughs> opportunity. You know, we don't but, take p p photos like that of politicians anymore. Maybe yeah, we should. <laughs> but my grandfather was a supervisor in the city for more than a decade and had an office at 690 Market Street. And I used to come here and, you know, I, you know, um, also you're, you know, we had some fabulous reporters come and talk to me and show me photos of my grandfather that I had never seen, including he was in homeless shelters here in the city and as a supervisor was focused on getting more programs for the homeless and also got voted down by <laughs> the mayor at the time. So it was quite a, something in my DNA, it's all repeating. You know, well, my whole life has already been lived, evidently, so. He, he's, <laughs> he's also called, uh, you, you've called him the father of BART, a lot of people have called him the father of BART. He wanted to, BART to be a monorail system. So lots of innovative ideas in, in the, the 50s, family tree. My grandfather had a vision that San Francisco, all nine counties, could be connected with a monorail and designed a monorail station that you ran in the newspaper yesterday next to City Hall. I think because his office was in City Hall, he could just walk right into the <laughs> station. And it looked like a spaceship. And it was a monorail, and it was going to run on both bridges. And he had the Army Corps of Engineers certify that the bridges could handle this or something, at least that's the story. And then all of a sudden, real estate developers of a shopping center in San Mateo really focused on San Mateo from dropping out of the Bay Area Rapid Transit District. When San Mateo County dropped out, San Jose dropped out. And when San Jose dropped out, Marin dropped out. And that's why we have a six-county system and not a nine-county system. So, but that's all way back in the 50s and before my time. Um, but I was able to see him see the success of BART. And also, if you go to the Embarcadero BART station, you'll see a big granite plaque. And somehow, you have a photo of me from when I was 21 years old, sitting there, watching my grandfather give a speech Yes, the hair, the hair is a little different. 
<laughs> it was, yeah, I, I didn't believe it was you when I saw the photo initially. Thank you for that, very much. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk to me about your grandmother, Helen? Yes, I can. My, my grandmother on my father's side, Helen Benioff, who is Helen Harris, she, uh, no relation to my founder, Parker Harris, co-founder, Parker Harris, Helen Harris um, had a large department store here with her husband, Fred, called Benioff's department store on Union Square. And then she went on to have her own retail stores and also became the president of the local or the California National Retail Association and was the first woman president and then was all fought for gender equality in the retail industry. And I only found out a lot about that because on eBay, I found a photo of her that ran in a newspaper, and on the back was her buffo bio. And it was really awesome to see that. And she was a, a tremendous advocate for women's rights and was a tremendous uh, business leader. Another thing that's maybe baked into the DNA, a, into a, the DNA. a little bit. Um, and she, she lived in these um, up the apartment building right down here the Fontana, or is it down right down next yeah. to Girardelli Square? Yeah. Those two big towers. Yes. And I used to come down and spend the weekend down here, and she would tell me stories about her, what she was working on. Well, it was very unusual to have a woman entrepreneur in, in those days, and, and your father was also in the retail business. Mm -hmm. Did you right. ever think that maybe women's fashion was in the cards for you? Well, on Saturdays, we used to, you know, my father was an entrepreneur. He had six women's clothing stores, and we'd have a Buick station wagon. He would load the clothes in the back of the station wagon, and we'd deliver it to the different stores. And then I would be, you know, we'd reprice them, change things, move things around, talk to the salespeople, try to find out what was going on in the market, and I'd spend the day with my father. And then we'd come back at the, you know, end of the day, and uh, the, the car would be empty, and we would have had done our job. And after doing that for a while, I decided I did not want to be in the women's clothing business. <laughs> and I was actually going to Burlingame High School. I um, had a job at uh, Kern's Jewelry Store on Burlingame Avenue. And all of a sudden, I walked across the street and I went into Radio Shack. And they had this uh, spiffy new computer called a TRS-80 Model 1 for $500. And I'm like, well, this is really a nice computer. And I had never really you know, seen a computer like this before. And I was starting to learn how to use it in Radio Shack. And I went and talked to my grandmother, uh, Frederica. And I said, you know, I'd really like to buy this computer. It's $500. And she said, well, if you pay half, I'll pay half. So I worked in my jewelry, the jewelry store in high school, made the $250, went in there. got She gave me the two, matched me. And I was able to buy the computer. And then, when I was 15 years old, I sold my first piece of software, which was called How to Juggle, to Sea Load Magazine in Goleta, California. How did that and work? And that was the beginning of my software career. Did it actually and teach you And I was you out how? of the women's clothing industry, finally. <laughs> did it actually teach you how to juggle? And it taught you how to juggle. Do you know how to juggle? I know how to juggle. J literally, not I like I literally not, do. You literally do. do. When we get some private time, I'll show you. OK. <laughs> Well, speaking of juggling, one a question from the audience. Um, you bought Time Magazine, so now you kind of are editor in chief. Why did are I you? I am not. No? no, are you? Can you do you veto covers? What's that? Can you veto covers? No. No. Is that something I should be able to do? No. No. <laughs> but I thought no, I'd we ask. Have, we are caretakers, I would say, more than you know owners. You know, we're here. Time Magazine. Look, at the end of the day. Nothing is more important right now at this moment of time than trust and truth. I, that's where we are, I think, as a society. And, and, you know, Lynn is the chairperson of uh, Time Magazine and is doing a great job running it. Uh, and I am trying to be the co-chairperson with her, but it's hard because she's way, you know, five steps ahead of me. And um, it's a lot of fun, actually, because we have a fabulous team there in New York City. Um, and, you know, their, their job is to deliver world-class journalism and to break stories and to be great, um, uh, great news people. And they are. They're doing a fabulous job. And I don't know if you've recently seen some of the Time magazines. Mm -hmm. 
then, but I recommend everybody subscribe. <laughs> uh, and they've won a number of awards. They're doing films, they're doing magazine, they're doing digital, they're doing events. They did an incredible summit last week called the Time Health Summit, which features the Time 100 leaders. They do the person of the year. It's an incredible organization. And what we saw was we got a phone call that they were looking for somebody to take care of it, to caretake it. We felt it is very important for us. It is as important philanthropically as our beloved children's hospital at UCSF, um, or even uh, many of the other uh, key pro philanthropic programs that we have. And we want to make sure that Time Magazine is massively successful and does a great job. And so we're honored to be part of that team. So success in business, media mogul, the next step, f historically speaking, is usually running for office. You've sworn this off. No, that was a strange look. Well, Definitely never. The whole point of the book is, and you're going to see it on the cover, it says business is the greatest platform for change. Everything I've been able to do so far in terms of giving back to society to help improve the state of the world has come through the business. And I think, by the way, Time Magazine is very much an example of that. It's a platform for improving the state of the world. That's why I want to get involved with it. And th this is what I think is really important right now. I think that you know, we're, we're, we're all part of improving the state of the world. We cannot push this to our politicians, especially right now. I'm, I'm sure even the politicians would agree it's somewhat dysfunctional. You know, So we need to take ownership of our world, of our environment, of our society, of the homeless, of our public schools, each and every one of us can do something. Each one of us can. Uh, <laughs> everybody can adopt a public school. I recently adopted a, uh, Salesforce has 107 public schools that we've adopted. Every senior vice president is required to adopt a public school. We've given s about $70 million to the local San Francisco and Oakland public schools. It's very important to us that our public schools are successful. And the other thing that's extremely important to me is that each of these schools is a success. So like one of our schools, which is Presidio Middle School, uh, right here, we've just put an incredible new playground in and so forth. And I was there, I was giving a speech, and for some reason they decided to bring the kids out to hear the speech. Just like I was apologizing to the kids ahead of time, telling them how boring the speech was going to be. <laughs> and, you know, I'm looking into the eyes and the hearts of these kids who are going to this important middle school in San Francisco, public middle school. They are my stakeholders. If my business is not designed to also serve them, then what have I built over 21 years? If, the, if Salesforce, when you see this tower, you don't think they're focused on the public schools, they're focused on the homeless, they're focused on the children's hospitals. Then what have I been doing for two years, two decades? I've been wasting my time because our life is only about a couple of things. One of them is kind of what we talked about, being present, being happy, enjoying our life. And the other is improving the lives of others and helping others and supporting others and making the world better. Those two things, that's to me what life is all about. So that's what's on my mind. How am I trying to help the world? How am I trying to repair the world? How do I am trying to improve the state of the world? And my business is my probably my greatest platform for doing that. And that's why I love Salesforce. That's why I love the business. That's why I love San Francisco. A lot of these ideas are probably very pure San Francisco ideas. Born out of the summer of love, born out of the minds of great entrepreneurs like Levi Strauss or Don and Doris Fisher or you know, many of the entrepreneurs that have come, you know, bef before us. And um, that, that's what makes me, Warren Hellman is another great example. These are people who influenced me, who I knew along the way, not Levi Strauss, but you get the idea, <laughs> you know, to make sure that my business is able to improve the world. Not just, I'm not just here to extract, you know, profit and at a maximum level, at the point where I've stripped away everything else. Hopefully, Salesforce is making San Francisco a little bit better as it goes and as it scales up. I ideally would like San Francisco to improve the world, to be an example also to other entrepreneurs of what they can do. That's why I'm very excited that over 9,000 companies have now adopted our 111 model.
that, that's been very gratifying to me that that little idea so many other companies have also adopted. And I don't usually give these types of speeches or public talks, you know, only because we wrote this book, Trailblazer, am I doing a speech here? I'm usually speaking in front of CEOs of very large companies. In fact, that's why I was in Munich. I was speaking to a very large company, 500 top executives in Germany about this topic. That's what I really enjoy doing because I'm trying to get the top CEOs in the world to really think differently about what they can do uh, with, their, with, their, with their businesses. So we're almost out of time, but I have one last question for you, and it's about a reference in the book uh, that your grandfather worked at the De Young Building, which was originally the Chronicles newsroom. Oh, wow. And yeah, it was I mean, when it was owned by the De Young family. And, and as you point out in the book, at the time it was the tallest skyscraper in all of San Francisco. And the De Young said that they were building a building not that the journalists would look down to the people, but that the people would look up to the journalists. Oh, that's a good one. And it occurs to me that that's kind of exactly what you're doing at Salesforce Tower too. Well, when I got to the top of Salesforce Tower the first time when it was being built and before the windows were on and it was a little scary. You went up there before the windows were on? And the That's wind is, crazy. Wind is blowing <laughs> through it and so forth and you're going up on the construction elevators. I could walk all the way around the building and see the view and I could see. And I said, you know, only people on an airplane have really been able to see what I'm seeing. And you could really study from Mount Diablo to the Marin Headlands to the ocean to San Jose. And I said, everybody deserves to see this. So we call the top of our buildings the Ohana floors. Ohana is um, the Hawaiian word for family. And it's, um, I, the idea is, is that when, and it's happening tonight actually just as I was leaving, that after hours and on the weekends, we turn over the floor to nonprofits and NGOs, people who are trying to raise money or do things for other people and say everyone should have access to this floor to make it for other, pe for other people's benefit. And in fact, one other thing that we do is on Saturdays, we, um, there's a tour you can apply and go for free to the top because I think this is really a public asset. Just because we have the top floor and we lease it, you know, it should not just be exclusively ours. It has to be part of our culture to give back. And that's an integrated part of our philosophy so that every thread of what we're doing. By the way, I was just in New York on Thursday. We have a Salesforce Tower too there. Indianapolis, we have a Salesforce Tower. London, we have a Salesforce Tower. In each of these places, there's an Ohana floor with the exact same philosophy and the mindfulness rooms and the culture and all the other things because we want to be an example not just to here in San Francisco. These people are already enlightened. They've already had the time. <laughs> San Francisco, we already have been through it. We got there. We're at the top, tippy top of consciousness. <laughs> but, but for all those other people in the world, <laughs> we have to have our little vestige of San Francisco, which is our Salesforce Towers, with these values. And when you walk in, they all look very similar, like you're walking into a Starbucks is always the same. Salesforce Towers are very much the same. And, you know, it's the same values. You know, it's not just San Francisco values in San Francisco, it's San Francisco values in these different cities as well. And we're there to stand for hopefully trust and customer success and innovation equality everywhere that we go. And yes, we might have picked it up here at the Summer of Love, but we want to give that love now to everybody else. That's extremely important to us and who we are at Salesforce. And, um, I would say that probably, you know, we don't do it perfectly. You've, you've laid out a number of cases where over 21 years we've made mistakes, we've had problems. I think forgiveness is something that, you know, we have to cultivate a lot more as well in ourselves, in our companies. We have to be able to talk about it more as executives. You know, believe me, the reason that I have a great board of directors is because I have to come in and ask for forgiveness a lot, you know? <laughs> you know, gee, I you know, made another mistake, sorry, you know? And I think only through forgiveness that can we kind of rebuild that love and then give more love back out to the world. Well said. The book, the book is Trailblazer, The Power of Business as the Greatest Platform for Change. Mr. Benioff, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much, Audrey.
Thank you so much. Great job.